Um, so hello everyone. Welcome to the last session of our webinar series uh, in celebration of Sir Harry Badisha's retirement. Uh, we would like to first thank all our speakers uh, across the world who have presented at this webinar series. And some of you have been here since our first lecture, so thank you for joining us. Uh, today, we are honored to have Professor Roger Reed as our first speaker. Professor Reed is the Professor of Engineering Science and Materials at the University of Oxford. He's a world leader uh, in engineering science of high temperature alloys, particularly the design and processing of nickel superalloys. His pioneering work via alloy by design approaches has transformed understanding of the high temperature capabilities of this material. And it has led to both improved and new corrosion resistant superalloys. Uh, Professor Reed is a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering, and he was also formerly a PhD student of Sir Harry uh, in 1987. Without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Reed to present his talk. Over to you, Roger. Thank you very much, Adriel, and I hope you can all hear me uh, wherever you are in the world. So I'm going to talk about uh, breakaway oxidation of nine chrome uh, martensitic uh, stainless steels, particularly in uh, carbon dioxide, which uh, um, the, re the reason for which hopefully will become apparent uh, in due course. I'd like to credit also um, Dr. Ilan Gong, who has been a, a postdoc in my uh, group for uh, a number of years, but who's recently uh, moved to uh, the Max Planck Institute in, 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 in Dusseldorf. And if you would like to read uh, something about our, our work, uh, some papers have been published. Uh, some examples are given here at the bottom uh, of this slide. So um, here's a picture of, of, of me with uh, Sir Harry uh, at the Sheffield meeting, I think two years ago something like this. And of course, um, as Adriel was saying, I was uh, one of uh, Harry's uh, uh, early uh, PhD students. I did my PhD with him uh, between 1987 and 1990, if my memory serves me uh, correctly. And Harry was uh, a really uh, superb um, uh, uh, PhD advisor. Uh, I, I probably didn't uh, thank him enough at the time and also subsequently, but uh, he really uh, uh, was a brilliant uh, a man who was so patient and uh, kind. Uh, he taught me uh, uh, nearly everything I, I know, particularly about the way uh, in which science uh, should uh, be done. So I'd like to, at least at the uh, beginning and end of the lecture, say one or two things about, uh, about that. Um, when I started uh, working with Harry uh, in uh, 1987, I had, um, um, well, there were a number of um, uh, PhD projects available by the staff in uh, the um, uh, University of, of Cambridge. And you can see I've listed some of them uh, here. Uh, you can see I had some narrow escapes, maybe. <laughs> I didn't pick uh, 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 any of them other than, of course, the one given by uh, uh, Harry or offered by Harry. And um, I was very grateful to him. He had uh, acted as tutor to me uh, between uh, 1985 and 87, I think, and he was always in his office at the top of the tower um, in uh, the new museum site, always there, always very patient, would always um, uh, answer my uh, questions and queries, of which there were many um, in uh, the uh, supervisions, as we, as we call them, um, uh, because he was uh, at that time uh, supervising students from Corpus Christi College, where I was um, where I was based. So I picked the, uh, the, the, the project that Harry offered uh, me, and I'm very grateful uh, to that. It was really clear to me from uh, Harry's lectures in the undergrad um, course that he was so passionate about uh, not just his uh, subject matter, but also the manner in which he would uh, go about his teaching. And, and uh, I was sure that it would be carried over to uh, my um, uh, supervision for my PhD. And that also did, of course, turn out to be uh, the case. Um, I ended up uh, getting a PhD. I worked on uh, uh, multi-pass uh, steel welds and we had a lot of fun. I remember, for example, in those days, Harry used to quite regularly take uh, us for lunch um, rather generously to uh, Darwin College. We had many uh, nice times uh, uh, in that college um, uh, with, for example, uh, uh, Dr. Manibu Takahashi, who was my uh, Classmate uh, ended up, of course, being uh, famously the uh, uh, research director of uh, Nippon Steel in, uh, in in Futsu in Japan. Um, and of course, some things don't 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 change. 
Um, I worked on uh, multipass uh, steel wells where one has a really uh, strong uh, reheating effect from the um, weld beads which are placed one on top of each other. These things are of course uh, very important for um, steam generating uh, power plant. And I had uh, the job of, uh, of trying to make a simulation of this uh, uh, type of multipass uh, weld. Uh, Harry of course had done a lot of work with uh, ESAB and other um, uh, welding manufacturers on single pass welds and he wanted to extend uh, the technology towards uh, multipass welds. Um, I find myself actually 30 years later, and it seems more than 30 years later, uh, thinking about the way in which um, lasers interact with each other, laser beams interact with each other for 3D printing. And of course, as you can see, the patterns of um, uh, microstructure are, uh, are quite similar to what I worked on all those years ago. Um, so maybe you can argue that some things uh, haven't changed uh, very much, but then maybe uh, they have, because you can see here that... Uh, um, you do uh, end up losing your hair if you get into the business of metallurgy, right? So you, you do end up uh, uh, being some, somewhat something different. Um, <clears throat> later on, um, Harry uh, helped me, uh, and I know uh, very clearly that he did, to come back to Cambridge, uh, where uh, we, of course, set up uh, the Rolls-Royce Technology Center, which was uh, where I, of course, started to get into uh, nickel base uh, super alloys. And the department was uh, uh, kind enough to refurbish the uh, MRC hut uh, for us. Um, of course, the MRC hut was where uh, I understand Pritz and Brenner, Crick and Watson uh, were, were uh, involved in, in uh, working out the structure of uh, DNA. And if you look at the literature which they which they wrote, they they speak about the the spirit of the hut, which <laughs> always in, intrigued me. And also their uh, meetings in uh, the Eagle. Um, we, of course, I don't uh, think managed to recreate the spirit of the hut, but we certainly did have many uh, meetings in uh, the Eagle, which we uh, enjoyed. So you have here a, a picture of, of, of us, uh, I think in 1995, um, David Knowles and, of course, uh, Howard Stone, uh, Christine Carey, Colin Small, and, of course, a very young looking uh, Phil Withers uh, there. So we had a lot of fun uh, in those days. And you, I guess you have to ask Howard Stone whether we managed to create recreate the spirit of uh, of the hut okay well as everybody knows uh, uh when one talks to harry uh, you have a very nice time but uh, harry always wants to talk about uh, technical matters related to steel and so i'm going to in his honor uh this afternoon uh talk about um uh the work we have done uh, in my group recently on on steel and in particular uh, nine chrome moly uh, steels, which are relevant for uh, nuclear uh, applications. Um, I have been involved uh, in uh, a large uh, uh, program, a national project organized by uh, EDF Energy with many, many uh, partners um, who have contributed to uh, our activity. I've given some, uh, some symbols here of the different organizations who have played a, a role. And I'll try to summarize uh, the key points uh, this afternoon. So this national project uh, ran from uh, 2014 until 2021, so only recently uh, finished. And many, many people uh, worked collaboratively uh, on this uh, effort, uh, which was led by uh, Jonathan Pearson, who is an ex-graduate uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, the department uh, in, in Cambridge. And I'd like to credit also particularly uh, Yun Gong, who was the a senior postdoc working in my group and also the universities of uh, Cranfield and Loughborough um, amongst others. So I want to start with this slide which actually is um, uh, shows you how the power requirement of uh, the UK uh, varies uh, on uh, a day-to-day -day basis um, uh, across um, 24 hours as uh, was the picture in uh, 2014 when our national project started. And you can see actually that uh, uh, on average, the requirement of our country is about 40 gigawatts, but it oscillates between 30 and maybe 50, maybe 55 on a day to night uh, basis. So the, um, the grid and the electrical uh, generating uh, suppliers have uh, uh, to contend with this thing. And also, of course, uh, a load which is highest uh, in the evenings before falling to a minimum uh, during uh, the middle of the night. And that, of course, reflects our patterns in business and uh, at, uh, in our homes. So in 2014, uh, there was about, I think, eight uh, gigawatts of uh, nuclear power. Um, 
about this much uh, uh, generated by coal. Um, there was uh, uh, some combined um, um, uh, uh, steam and, and gas turbine uh, activity, and then uh, some wind. And uh, we purchased some uh, power from overseas and then uh, some other things in there as well. And so one might have asked in 2014, what was the big uh, vision? And of course, in those days, at that point, I think, although most scientists who had their um, hats on would, would, would have appreciated there was a significant problem with the global warming, of course, it wasn't so generally well known to uh, the, uh, the politicians. And so uh, one might have thought about perhaps generating more uh, nuclear uh, power as a, as a base load, um, thinking about reducing the coal fired uh, plant uh, to zero and of course that has indeed uh, happened now or largely happened um, do some more wind that's also uh, clearly happened but uh, one of course has to uh, be a bit concerned about the uh, fluctuations in the uh, in the wind so one has to contend with this um, and then of course we try to get the solar up and up but of course the interesting thing of course is that the solar uh, power can be generated during uh, the day whereas one can argue that in fact one needs to have it uh, during uh, the evenings, which is of course not easy, so one starts to think about uh, batteries and, 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 and the like. And then maybe one has to do the topping cycle with some kind of uh, combined um, steam and gas uh, turbines. So that was uh, the vision to try and think about um, keeping our nuclear power plants open and even maybe uh, increasing them uh, in number. Of course, that hasn't readily happened either. But these charts do give you uh, a, a good uh, flavour for uh, the demands uh, on uh, the grid. So EDF Energy, who uh, sponsored our project, of course, are responsible or have been responsible for uh, operating and taking over the design of what's termed our advanced gas cooled uh, reactors. They were built in the period uh, between 1960 and uh, 1980. And it turns out now that uh, by uh, 2025, which is uh, only a few years away now, about half of these reactors will um, be uh, shut down. Um, but that there, of course, there are arguments being made about extending their life by just a few more years uh, to allow for further plant uh, to come uh, online or for other electricity generating capacity to be um, uh, put uh, in place. Now, uh, these uh, reactors are uh, quite unique in a number of ways, but uh, in particular, because of the use of coolant gas, uh, which is CO2. And so uh, this, of course, then gives some um, challenges for the corrosion of the boilers and the heat exchangers in uh, this part uh, of uh, the plant. Um, if you look at the, the way in which the, um, uh, the tubes uh, behave uh, in service, not uh, anticipated was the possibility of this so-called uh, breakaway uh, oxidation in the high pressure CO2, which is on the um, uh, active side of the uh, of, of the barrier here. Of course, one needs to have these steels to uh, conduct uh, heat so that one can heat steam on the inside of the pipes, because those then go off to the steam turbine where the power uh, is uh, generated. Now, I should say that so far, there have never been any examples of failure of these uh, pipes uh, by breakaway uh, oxidation. But of course, um, that possibility uh, exists. So the likes of EDF Energy, they conduct a high temperature or higher temperature tests to try to anticipate whether the plant uh, is uh, safe uh, or not. And they do this by using uh, gravimetric uh, uh, analysis uh, to measure the weight gain and uh, visual inspection uh, to look at uh, whether there is a change in the oxide uh, uh, microstructure. So this is what we have been uh, what we have been working on. And you can see here that if you look at typical weight uh, gain against time uh, data, then uh, of course, if one is at uh, temperatures close to uh, that of the reactor, maybe about 560 or 580 degrees Celsius, then the uh, data is uh, highly uh, uh, parabolic. But if one raises the temperature beyond uh, the temperatures at which the plant currently operates, then one can see that you can get a very aggressive attack occurring uh, quite uh, quickly. So of course, as Harry uh, taught me and uh, would have been uh, teaching other uh, uh, undergrads at, uh, at Cambridge, of course, we know uh, that the weight gain is uh, parabolic because of course the uh, thickness varies <coughs> as a square root of time. But this kind of aggressive attack um, 
occurs eventually, giving you this linear uh, post breakaway attack. And EDF Energy wanted to understand um, uh, and build models for uh, this phenomena to allow them to uh, make uh, good predictions or, about plant uh, safety. So this shows you schematically what uh, they have to contend with. Um, you do the post, you, you do the acceleration tests, uh, maybe at uh, uh, 580 or 600, 620 degrees uh, Celsius, but these are much higher temperatures than uh, the plant is uh, operating. And then the idea is that one ex uh, uh, extrapolates the behavior uh, at high temperatures to the lower temperatures to try to um, uh, make good judgments uh, scientifically and technologically about whether the uh, plant is uh, safe or not. So I hope that's, uh, that's, that's clear to everybody. So I'm going to start by uh, just showing you some of the uh, typical uh, experimental work and uh, observations um, that uh, happen. So this shows you here now uh, typical uh, uh, images of the, the fins. The fins are about one millimeter uh, uh, across here. And uh, you can see there's quite extensive um, uh, oxidation. Um, these are uh, accelerated tests after about two years. And you can see here that the, uh, the fins have gone into so-called uh, uh, breakaway oxidation. And if you look at the, um, the, the microstructure of uh, the fins uh, here, then there is uh, extensive evidence of carbides um, forming such that the net carbon uh, level is way beyond that that was uh, there in the original uh, steel. And you can prove that the uh, uh, carbide species are uh, the famous M23 uh, C6 uh, carbide here, and also some other evidence of uh, uh, chromium-rich um, uh, hexagonal HTP type carbides uh, present uh, in the microstructure. And if you look at the, um, uh, the microstructure close to the um, interface between the oxide and the uh, the metal, then a very uh, uh, interesting microstructure. You can see that the substrate is heavily carburized. So these are large M23 C6 carbides which are formed. And then around this is a, a spinel type um, uh, iron and chromium rich um, oxide, which uh, forms because of course the carbides then are becoming progressively oxidized uh, over time. So this is a, a interpretation of that microstructure. You have here the, uh, the carbides. The carbides are being attacked by uh, uh, a mixture of iron-rich and chromium-rich uh, spinels. And we have found also evidence of uh, porosity and even uh, graphite at this uh, interface uh, in uh, these materials. And a lot of um, lift-outs using modern techniques based upon, uh, upon atom probe uh, tomography to confirm uh, the, uh, the chemistry and the, uh, the microstructure of uh, these, um, th these phases. Of course, None of these things were possible when uh, I started my PhD with Harry, but uh, more and more, of course, these methods are becoming uh, more routine and, and, and standard. Also, I should uh, uh, credit the uh, people in Oxford who are very good at the likes of nanosims, have been able to uh, confirm um, the, the carburization or the presence of carbon in the oxide uh, close to the uh, interface with the, with the metal. So if one looks uh, more closely again, you can see uh, a distinction between the iron rich and the chromium rich uh, spinels and extensive um, examples of porosity and uh, um, um, uh, pores, which are close to the interface. And we think that this is a mechanism by which uh, the CO2 reaches the, um, uh, the metal because we see very little, if any, evidence of uh, carbon in the oxide phases, which are of form. So this leads us to think that uh, uh, the, um, the, the gas is able to reach uh, the interface without too much dissipation of, of, of energy. Well, uh, Ulan Gong has, uh, uh, is an expert in uh, numerical modeling. And what we have been working on now then is the uh, um, uh, absorption of carbon uh, by uh, the reactions at the metal scale uh, interface, because we thought this would be a way in which we could make good estimates about the extent of uh, attack, which would then inform um, the safety case for EDF Energy keeping their uh, nuclear power stations on for uh, just uh, a few uh, more years. And you can see here uh, the evidence of uh, the kind of soft impingement uh, and impingement rules, which Harry, of course, uh, knows uh, all about and uh, taught me actually uh, for my uh, PhD. So in 
this work, uh, which has been uh, done in collaboration with EDF Energy, I've really been able to build on the teachings of uh, my uh, PhD supervisor. And isn't it just uh, amazing uh, uh, how often that uh, happens uh, in, in science? So you can see here that F1 measures the um, uh, carbon profile across the fin. So this is about one millimeter here. We, of course, couldn't uh, measure easily the carbon in the ferrite. But what we could do was to uh, do stereological measurements to uh, deduce the carbon uh, present from uh, measurements uh, made on the local carbon uh, fraction. And that convinced us, and you can see here our data and also the, the underlying models, that uh, the, the fins were becoming saturated with uh, carbon uh, over uh, time. And again, more evidence uh, here, you can see uh, a logarithm of time and, and temperature, um, reciprocal temperature, but the corresponding temperature on the, on the top of this graph. If we look at uh, the data um, at uh, 640 degrees Celsius, you can see over time, with increasing time, the interface uh, between the uh, metal and the, uh, um, the scale in the metal is becoming progressively decorated with more and more carbides. Uh, so there is actually evidence also of uh, an enrichment of uh, uh, carbon at uh, that uh, interface, which gives us a, a, an issue around how to handle that boundary condition in the model, which I'll say a few things about in just a few moments. Um, <clears throat> I also would like to credit uh, Cranfield University because you can see uh, from uh, the evidence I presented so far that the attack is quite um, aggressive, so that once the attack starts to go, we need to know how much of the, the metal has been uh, degraded and destroyed by the oxidation uh, reaction. So I'd like to credit uh, Cranfield University and also Loughborough University and Birmingham as well, who have made lots of measurements of uh, the, the thickness of the oxide as a function of different geometries and temperatures and times and, and, and so forth, which has helped us um, uh, with our uh, modeling uh, activity. Okay, so now I'm going to say something about uh, some of the details of the theoretical model that we have put together uh, for this project. So um, I'd like to start by uh, just pointing out, of course, this is quite complex. You have a nine chrome aluminum steel, you have a, a spinel and then a magnetite a based iron rich uh, spinel on top. Then you have this gas, which of course is uh, quite complicated in its composition. And then we have um, uh, a zone here where we have the uh, interfacial uh, reaction. And you can see here from the uh, evidence presented in this graph that when one goes across the fin, so this is again a, a one millimeter, the length scale here, and one plots the, the volume fraction of the carbides, eventually, I think this data is for 600 degrees Celsius, so I apologize this isn't on this graph, but eventually the, um, the fin becomes totally sat saturated with um, uh, carbon or carbide, corresponding to an activity of one, okay? But th this actually takes some time uh, to occur. And moreover, one has to acknowledge the uh, destruction of some of the underlying metals. So that's why this line uh, moved in slightly, but also the boundary condition at the metal scale interface uh, evolves with time such that that um, enrichment uh, increases with time. So one doesn't have a constant concentration or a constant activity, one has an increasing one with time. And so this is consistent with what's known as the uh, boudoir uh, reaction and gives a, a proportionality of the flux crossing the interface and the activity difference uh, across the interface as one approaches the equilibrium. And that boundary condition I didn't really know about until this um, um, project, but you can see one needs to have this proportionality constant, uh, which is known as the uh, Robin uh, uh, coefficient, which of course is uh, also temperature dependent. And this, this reaction or this, this, this boundary condition here is uh, consistent with uh, chemical reaction control at a, move, at a moving interface. So you can see here that as uh, we progress through in time, the uh, carbon content or the net carbon content at the interface is increasing. Um, when we uh, first started to model this effect, we uh, did this in a rather empirical way, just by uh, assuming that the concentration evolved using a, an exponential term consistent with this expression uh, here. And then when we really started to think about this, um, we realized that this uh, first order reaction is uh, what we needed uh, to do. 
where now this Robin boundary condition is a, a function of temperature. So I'm going to give you some data in just a few moments about, uh, about that parameter. And this graph on the bottom left isn't quite right. I don't really think it's perfect, but you can see here that the, the net idea is that there's a, an activation energy over which the carbon has to overcome before it can enter into the, uh, the, uh, uh, the steel. And, and probably uh, this uh, activation barrier isn't solely an interface, maybe extending to the oxide, we think, or I think, uh, to uh, a, a degree. OK, so of course, Harry knows uh, very well and taught me uh, the mathematics of diffusion very nicely. Um, so we can write down a fixed first law. We have to think in principle about diffusion of carbon uh, through the ferrite. But in principle, of course, there's a large volume fraction of carbide. So you could imagine uh, needing to uh, consider also uh, the uh, the flux through the carbides. But of course, as we all know, the carbon doesn't uh, diffuse readily through carbide. So one can simplify things here. And uh, I won't go through all of the details of the of the mathematics, but in the end, what one has to think about is the effective uh, diffusion coefficient of carbon uh, in uh, the system, which is proportional to the um, diffusivity of carbon in, in, in ferrite, but also uh, of, of relevance here is this uh, differential term here, which is the rate of change of the carbon concentration in, in, in ferrite with the, the net carbon concentration. And it's this effective diffusion coefficient which has to be inserted into the, um, uh, the diffusion equation here for uh, the, the, the treatment of this problem. This graph, uh, these, these graphs show you uh, Ilung Gong's uh, estimates of the effective diffusion coefficient as a function of the mole fraction of carbon. You can see there's a very strong uh, carbon um, um, uh, effective net, the net carbon concentration. Different curves here uh, deduced from our uh, 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 calculations and our, our, our data. The discontinuity in the um, in the curves, for some of the curves, arises because uh, we are not certain, or, the, or really because of the local equilibrium assumption, and because there's a phase transition associated with the formation of uh, the carbide uh, species, and in particular, the transition from the M7 or the M23C6 carbide to M73C3 carbide, which we partially see in the uh, IOZ uh, zone. So if we ignore that transition, we have a line uh, which is a, which is a dotted one. So you can see many uh, calculations done by Dr. Gong. I would say that the EDF energy people and the nuclear inspectorates are, are very, very rigorous in their uh, pushing of us to do uh, calculations in many, many different uh, ways. Um, we have um, also very carefully uh, uh, measured the uh, carbon profile as a function of, of temperature and time. You can see typical estimates here for the enrichment and also uh, made measurements on uh, unfinned uh, tubes, where, of course, one can have a, a semi-infinite diffusion of, of, of carbon. One of the, the observations here actually has been that the um, literature uh, uh, values of the diffusivity that we, we, we derived um, needed to be corrected um, by a small uh, correction parameter uh, zeta here. Um, which is, a, again, a function of temperature, because uh, we couldn't uh, get the very best agreement with our experimental uh, data by assuming values uh, uh, and thermodynamical assessments uh, made uh, in uh, the literature. So you can see here that although we came up with a very nice um, uh, estimate for the kinetics of the boudoir reaction, this alpha parameter here, normalised against the, the molar volume, um, we have come up with uh, what we believe to be some of the first uh, kinetic data for uh, the boudoir reaction. Um, we we still had to uh, correct our uh, carbon diffusion co coefficients um, by a, a, a relatively small factor, uh, zeta here, which uh, um, was uh, of order maybe one at uh, the higher temperatures, but actually had to be increasingly enlarged, uh, perhaps between three and five as one got down to the reactor temperatures. So I think an interesting thing here is that one has to um, acknowledge, I think, sometimes uh, in science and engineering and technology that one has to deal with imperfection. Um, EDF Energy wanted to have uh, what they perceived to be an accurate model, which wasn't necessarily consistent with the very greatest uh, um, uh, physical fa faithfulness of, the, of, of all of the parameters. Yulong Gong also has made uh, many 
um, calculations uh, to uh, work out uh, the effect of transitioning from uh, one dimensional to two dimensional or even three dimensional uh, carbon uh, saturation because of course the um, uh, breakaway at the at the corners is uh, uh, the most uh, prevalent in, 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 in this system. And this uh, slide uh, summarizes uh, our approach, which is to say that a breakaway uh, occurs when uh, the reservoir of metal associated with the substrate is um, uh, sufficiently exhausted. The activity of carbon at the interface then approaches um, uh, that of, of, of one, and then uh, graphitization of the interface um, uh, occurs, and uh, uh, the uh, failure of the oxide uh, ensues uh, very rapidly uh, from that point. But you can see again in science, one has uh, 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 to deal with a scatter uh, in uh, data. You can see particularly at 600, 620, and 640 degrees Celsius, uh, the, the error bars here, or the, the data points, I should say, Give you an inkling uh, and an idea about the uh, the scatter in the data uh, available to EDF energy and of course one has to uh, interpolate through this um, but as I say the basic idea is to come up with uh, an estimate of uh, whether the reactor is safe based upon the available um, uh, reservoir of, of, of metal uh, available to uh, further take up uh, carbon uh, in uh, these systems. Of course uh, uh, interesting um, uh, scientific observations are made. So you can see here we were able to um, rationalize the, the fraction of the mass gain, which is due to uh, oxygen, so due to the oxidation reaction, and then also the uh, carburization. Of course, the, you can see here that actually with, 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 with temperature, the amount of uh, oxidation, um, the amount of weight gain due to, to, to carbon is approximately constant, consistent, uh, consistent with our uh, reservoir uh, effect. And on the right hand side here, if, we, if one plots the time uh, to carbon saturation against inverse temperature, then you can see that an empirical fit to the, the high temperature data would lead to uh, a line like so, which goes more or less asymptotically to uh, the reactor temperature, about 520 degrees Celsius. But we were able to show actually that those calculations are um, quite in error, and one needs to uh, do a better job using a, a more physically based model uh, using. Uh, uh, what I described to you in, 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 in um, simple terms uh, this afternoon. So as always with science, there are outstanding uh, questions, which Harry, of course, uh, probably can shed light on. One of the issues is uh, the mechanism of carbon transport through uh, the oxide layer. In all of our experiments over six or seven years, we have never been able to find any carbon uh, dissolved uh, in uh, the uh, oxide uh, species. Um, spinels, magnetite, these are atom probe uh, data. Um, we don't find any carbon there, which leads us to kind of wonder how uh, the CO2 or carbon can migrate uh, through uh, the oxide. Also, uh, of course, uh, we were a bit surprised that carbon is uh, transporting uh, a bit faster than we uh, had uh, expected. Of course, you can uh, criticize the simplicity of some of the modeling. Um, we uh, used the local equilibrium assumption, which of course I had studied long and very hard uh, for uh, my PhD. But of course, these carbines are rich in uh, chromium, uh, but they may not be uh, rich in chromium consistent with uh, the local equilibrium assumption. And certainly we do see uh, in these uh, steels evidence of um, uh, kinetic retardation and uh, a failure to reach true uh, local equilibrium. So that's probably one of the reasons why uh, this parameter here that has to be uh, introduced in an empirical sense. So I won't uh, read all of the uh, conclusions, but we've been studying uh, breakaway oxidation um, using uh, numerical models based on interface and diffusion controlled uh, phase trans uh, transformation, much uh, like the kind of things which Harry uh, uh, um, did with uh, Greg Olson in the late 1980s when he was uh, uh, writing brilliant uh, papers on uh, coupled uh, diffusional and displacive uh, transformations and really thinking about uh, the boundary conditions uh, present in these sorts of uh, uh, reactions. Um, even after about 30 years of thinking about diffusion controlled uh, reactions and reading the likes of Crank and uh, the theory of diffusion and working with people like uh, Colin Atkinson, I, I really thought I knew a lot about um, 
diffusion. But I had to uh, admit that I didn't know about the Robin uh, type of boundary condition where one has a time dependent uh, uh, effect. So it just goes to show you that in science, you have to be prepared for uh, surprises and, and, and being prepared to go back to uh, textbooks and, and, and learning again. We don't really understand, um, I think in our experiments anyway, um, the exact magnitude of the uh, diffusivity of, of, of carbon and ferret. And of course, things are um, made more difficult by um, uh, the uh, the uh, assumption of local equilibrium and, and the, the fact that really we need to have a, a better model of the carbide uh, precipitation and uh, dissolution and it's attacked by uh, uh, the oxidation uh, reactions. But it has been uh, a great uh, a pleasure to um, work with uh, EDF Energy who have been uh, really uh, great uh, sponsors. You can do, uh, of course, great science uh, sometimes, I think, uh, whilst actually making your uh, uh, science relevant to uh, technological uh, applications and keeping uh, the lights on, uh, which of course is a, is a great joy and consistent again with what uh, Harry uh, used to uh, uh, teach me, uh, you know, make assumptions, move on, uh, try and the, the science will, of course, the interesting questions will uh, uh, come uh, uh, forth uh, in time. So ha another picture again, a reminder, thank you uh, so much uh, to uh, you, Harry, for great uh, training uh, of me. Uh, you were always in my mind, actually. What would Harry uh, do? Uh, I, in, in, in preparing this lecture, I, I really thought uh, strongly about uh, the role that Harry uh, played uh, on uh, me. Uh, of course, uh, I owe really my scientific career uh, to his <coughs> training. And he has been, of course, an inspiration, not just to me, but to all of us. It has been just, of course, impossible uh, to match his uh, work ethic and his insight and uh, brilliance of his of his mind, but uh, we, of course, have to try. Um, I thought a bit about what uh, he uh, taught me. And really, uh, I think uh, 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 he taught me to be quantitative, to build models, put numbers into equations, to make approximations, to do some predictive modeling. And uh, what I would say there is, uh, you know, to do science the way it should uh, be done. Um, uh, so that's uh, been a, a fantastic thing. I think, um, all of us, of course, would say that uh, Harry was one of the first uh, mature scientists to really uh, embrace the power uh, of modelling. I remember when I uh, had my uh, supervisions with Harry in the uh, uh, early to mid 1980s, even then uh, he was always on uh, his PC. And uh, I remember, Harry, uh, your Amstrad uh, computer, which uh, I think must have got completely worn out uh, by your tapping at the, uh, the keys. Harry was one of the first, I think, to really embrace using um, uh, PCs to do his uh, uh, numerical modeling. So being bold, being inquisitive, um, being uh, uh, brave enough to uh, 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 propose models and hypotheses, uh, and then uh, using experiments to try to see whether your ideas are correct and if necessary, modifying them. Now that iteration of uh, theory, uh, modeling and experiment is of course at the heart of, of what we do. And of course, Harry was, uh, uh, doing it at first. And of course, I also want to uh, point out that it was really remarkable to me, or has been remarkable to me as well, to, to see the role that Harry has played in uh, bringing people together from all parts of the world. I'm very certain that there will be people listening uh, this afternoon from uh, probably all continents uh, around uh, the world. And Harry, that's a testament to your uh, capacity to uh, uh, break down um, cultures and, uh, and backgrounds. And uh, isn't it just uh, remarkable, actually, that uh, science and technology and uh, Harry Bidisha has the capacity to, uh, uh, to break down those barriers, which, of course, are so much uh, needed uh, these days. So, Harry, uh, we thank you sincerely for all you have done for us. And, of course, we are really looking forward to uh, your, your lecture this afternoon. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Roger, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, the floor is now open for questions, if there's any. You can raise, okay, I have a raised hand uh, from Jiang Guolin, please. Well, hi, Roger, and uh, it's nice to see you on uh, 
right, via internet and uh, still all okay, apart from the hair changes and uh, you have not changed since then, since the Cambridge time. And uh, my question is very simple. <laughs> and uh, for, I, I know you are expert on super alloys, uh, but I did not know you work on high temperature steel as well uh, uh, in the earlier time. And uh, if you compare the high temperature steels with the super alloys, and what kind of temperature are the high steel can up to and uh, maximum temperature to for safe to work? for gas turbine, for example? Um, well, it's a very good question. Um, of course, uh, the nickel-based super alloys are based on the face center cubic structure, which, uh, you know, Harry was the first to uh, teach me that the packing efficiency is about 74%, I think, something like that. Um, whereas the uh, BCC uh, structure of iron, I for iron anyway, of course, is 68%, uh, if I remember my undergrad numbers correctly. Um, so that um, Professor Benicia, you know, um, with his steels, uh, uh, you know, has always had a more open structure, which means that the uh, diffusivity of the, of the different elements is always going to be, uh, you know, quite a bit uh, larger than for the face center cubic uh, nickel. So, you know, I think once you get to temperatures of beyond about uh, 700, 750 degrees Celsius, the nickel based super alloys win out over the steels. But of course, um, in performance, but of course you have to uh, also account for the fact that uh, the super alloys are very much more expensive. Um, they contain uh, many expensive elements like chromium and rhenium and so forth, tantalum, tungsten, we add. So, um, you know, we, we have to acknowledge uh, um, that that's uh, going to be the case. But no, it's been a, it's been a very uh, nice to uh, remember uh, uh, and be, revisit uh, the physical metallurgy of, uh, of steels. And of course, here in Oxford also, I would say, as one further point, it seems to fall on me to give all the lectures on steels. And, you know, there aren't many of the uh, professors here in Oxford who, who know that much about um, um, steels and physical metallurgy anymore. And Harry always used to say to me that uh, I would never uh, not have a job, you know, if I if I if I if I studied uh, and worked on on steel, which is which has proven to be the case. So nice to hear from you, and uh, thank you for your question. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Uh, uh, Roger, uh, you are very generous with your uh, credit that you give me, but I have uh, two short questions. Sure. Uh, the first one is, you know, when you had a graph of effective diffusivity. Sure. And there were many different alloys. They didn't show much of a difference between the different alloys. So does that mean that there is no possibility of improving the alloy design? I, yes, I, I, I'm not sure of that because of course these alloys are very close to the, um, the, the nine chrome moly, uh, composition, which, um, I guess was uh, emerging from the Oak Ridge National Labs. Um, I know that they did uh, add silicon because they, they found that the, this improved the oxidation resistance and also pushed up a little bit the, the chromium uh, level. But I, I would imagine that actually in retrospect, one could radically uh, alter the composition to give you, uh, uh, you know, a, different, a different one. But of course, one of the issues here is that these, uh, you know, we are really studying um, uh, a large engineering system that was put in place in 1980, 1985. So decisions were made at that point about the composition and perhaps one wouldn't be able to easily go back and, and modify the steel. But certainly minor changes were made over the years. And, and that's one of the reasons why the different reactors actually have got slightly different uh, steel grades. Okay. And the second one was, uh, you know, you had chromium, et cetera, going into the oxide, but not carbon. Uh, chromium, yes. of course, uh, likes to be oxidized, but um, there are so many defects in oxides. Yes. Uh, you know, macro defects as well as uh, microscopic. Yes. That uh, you may not get carbon migrating through the oxide, but through the yes. defects. Yes. I, I think that's uh, a, a really good point. Um, and in fact, that's uh, what I personally uh, believe is happening here. If you look uh, 
closely at these structures. Um, you know, the oxide is um, full of defects uh, and porosity. And this is really due to the, or the Kirkendall effect, of course, that you, that you taught me about. You have fluxes moving in different directions um, and that gives you um, a net flux, which is uh, not, not zero and hence the formation of, the, uh, of, of, of this porosity. And in fact, uh, recently I saw some, um, some measurements made by Phil Withers group, I think, where they had used very high resolution tomography and were able to show that these pores are interconnected in three dimensions to give you a path for the for the transport of the CO2 gas through the scale. So that probably explains why um, we're able to get the carburization of the underlying structure without seeing the CO2 or carbon in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the scale. Many thanks. Thank you for the question. Uh, we have one question from Dr. Suresh Babu, uh, if, if you're there. I am here. Um, yeah. I'm here, Roger. I put the message anyway in the chat. Is it possible that we cannot detect the carbon because our current limitations in characterization techniques, even in Adam Pro, it's very difficult to find which boundaries to look at it, whether the carbon is there or not. Is there any way you can do in situ cleaving, uh, like what uh, Iso George did on the intermetallic boundaries? Is it possible to do that kind of experiments? Um nice to hear from you Suresh I, I we, we haven't done that I guess in principle it, 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 it could be done um, I would like to see those sorts of experiments uh, done but we, we haven't managed uh, we, we haven't managed that um, I'm not sure I can add I can add too much more to, to that but certainly uh, you know science sometimes uh, is surprising we certainly yeah. thought that uh, you know uh, given the extensive carburization of the underlying steel that, that, that one would expect to see some some carbon somewhere in the the oxide but you know we just uh, short, short of some uh, observations of graphite you know at the at the interface which happens uh, eventually once one has uh, very long times you know we, we don't see we don't see the carbon um, at times oh. before that. It's, it's intriguing thank you